Thanks very much, Jan. Thanks for inviting me to talk about uh, psoriatic arthritis. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a rheumatologist here in Wellington. I also work for uh, Tyrafidae DHB in Gisborne, where they don't have a rheumatology service except for me, uh, which has been uh, a lot of fun in the last couple of years. And, uh, I, don't, and I work at the uh, University of Otago, uh, Wellington too. So um, this is the money slide. Uh, these are the, the things that I want you to try and remember. Um, I've just been doing a, um, I'm, I'm currently kind of on sabbatical uh, at the moment and um, my sabbatical activity has been to start a undergraduate degree um, that includes philosophy and I've just been to a um, uh, level one critical thinking philosophy lecture uh, and so I should know about how to enhance your remembering of things. Um, except my memory is terrible so I can't <laughs> I can't um, uh, clearly uh, do that, but this is the thing. These are the five things I want you to um, to know about, and I'll hopefully be able to cover most of them, uh, except perhaps the last one we may not uh, get to in time. But hopefully, I will. So um, we'll start with the case. Um, he's a kind of a, a composite person uh, that I've called Mr. P.S. A uh, 34 year old man presenting with recurrent heel pain <coughs> and more recently uh, knee swelling. So, um, the first thing is evaluation. Um, what do you think would be the, the things that you should do uh, when you're assessing someone who presents in this kind of way? Just doing examination. Yes, okay. But can we be more specific? Examine the painful joints to see if there's any effusion and check the range of movement. And I guess you, since you mentioned that, check the skin for, for psoriasis. Okay, so examining the skin and examining the joints. Okay, fair enough. Anything else we, w we, w we need to know about? Of? Family history of psoriasis. Now, what, what, uh, apart from the title of this talk, why did you uh, immediately think of psoriasis when this guy presents with um, recurrent heel pain and a swollen knee? Enthesitis. Enthesitis, okay. Because? Because heel is Okay, so, those, so enthesitis and psoriatic arthritis kind of go together. Okay, great. Um, so family history of psoriasis, yes. Uh, maybe he has a history of psoriasis. We haven't asked him that yet, um, uh, but that would be relevant. Okay. So where do we mean by the heel, the anatomical location? Right, so is it behind the heel, under the heel? Um, yep, okay, how did it, uh, how did it start? Uh, what is it, what are the aggravating factors, is it worse in the mornings, all of those kinds of things. Yep, mm -hmm. Anything else? Yep. Any history of other swelling, like random negative swollen finger or sausage digit? Yep, okay, so other musculoskeletal symptoms and particularly a sausage digit, because that's strongly associated with um, uh, specific disorders. Sure. Yeah. Any other kind of evaluation you do? Blood tests, x-rays, imaging? Uric acid for gout. Uric acid for gout. What's the, what, what do you think the best test for, um, uh, for trying to figure out whether this man has gout or not would be? Um, yeah, so the, cl the clinical scenario would be really important. If, he, if somebody's presenting with, um, is it the swollen knee that makes you think of gout? Well, I mean, it's a differential um, uh, diagnosis. You know, that there's more than one joint involved, so probably less likely. So, knee, yeah. yeah, so a swollen knee could, uh, could certainly represent gout, but um, I guess we, we need to know whether it's very episodic or not. Uh, and if um, somebody's presenting with a persistently swollen knee that's been going on for more than a couple of weeks, 
and it's not, and he's not, he's, and he's, and he's not complaining of a lot of pain because we haven't heard that actually yet so much. Um, gout's very improbable, but even if you did think uh, of, about gout, what's the what's the kind of well, Guy's going to talk about this later on, but what's the kind of the key test? Absolutely. So a serum urate is not a diagnostic test for gout. <coughs> um, I'm sure Guy's going to emphasize that too. So uh, having uh, the synovial fluid examined under micro polarizing microscopy, that's the, that's, the, that's the best test for gout. Anyway, okay. So anything else we might do? Pardon me? Any history of trauma? Okay, so we want to know about whether this is a like a, a running injury, for example. You can get runners get heel pain like all the time, and uh, c could it be part of that? Um, okay, yep. Um, any blood tests? Uric acid we've heard about, yep. Inflammatory markers. Okay, so yep. Do we need to do rheumatoid tests? So a CR CRPs are useful tests for any kind of inflammatory, any any kind of disease that you think might be inflammatory. Um, the other kind of serological tests for uh, arthritis uh, are really not useful in in the group of diseases called spondyloarthropathies, unless you're thinking about excluding uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, you've heard about just now, is typically small joints, symmetrical, lots of joints. But, you know, some people do present in strange ways, uh, and um, it is possible to present with a single swollen joint uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, particularly if it's their very, very first presentation. So I wouldn't totally disregard the possibility of rheumatoid arthritis except for the fact that he's got uh, heel pain as a, as a dominating feature and that's not a feature of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay so these are the sorts of kind of things that I thought of uh, when uh, evaluating somebody with a um, uh, with few joints and in where, where heel pain is uh, uh, dominating so overuse trauma you know thinking about alternative um, pathologies, are the symptoms typically inflammatory, uh, which pretty much means very prolonged morning stiffness. So things getting worse in the morning is very common for any kind of musculoskeletal condition. But if it's, quite, if it's very prolonged, like more than 30 or 40 minutes, that's more likely to be due to an inflammatory disorder. Um, personal family history of psoriasis we mentioned. Other symptoms that go along with the, uh, with the spondyloarthropathy group of disorders, inflammatory back pain, inflammatory eye, pa eye, di eye disease, so iritis, has he ever had episodes of a painful red eye that's required steroid drops, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, or uh, symptoms that might reflect uh, reactive arthritis, so has he ha recently been overseas, uh, had a uh, um, sexually transmitted infection, um, eaten some dodgy chicken, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we talked about examination, didn't mention the nails, I think that that's very important, we might come to that. Um, uh, nail examinations are very useful in people with uh, psoriatic arthritis. I always think that asking somebody about how bad things are is important and, and that's often re uh, reflected in the, in, in the degree of functional impact. It might not necessarily help you with the diagnosis but it will help you with um, the tempo at which you need to do stuff. So if somebody's job's threatened or they need help with day-to-day um, -day activities then you might need to be a bit more urgent about um, referrals or, uh, or treatment. Um, some people think that uh, ultrasonography is a really good um, imaging test for uh, enthesiopathy. It might help uh, locate the, uh, the, the uh, and define the anatomical inflammation better. May or may not help with your diagnosis. Uh, mentioned inflammatory markers. Uh, CRP is often quite normal in people with psoriatic arthritis. So, the f so if it's at high, then that's good in the sense that it's um, it's helpful but if it's normal it doesn't rule out 
psoriatic arthritis by any means. Uh, and I mentioned uh, sexually transmitted uh, infection evaluation in the right kind of clinical context. You might want to think about chlamydia. That can often be uh, silent in men particularly, um, uh, or HIV. So, um, okay. So any questions about the, the evaluation stage? Uh, so if somebody has lots and lots of symptoms, yeah, well I think if, 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 if there are um, symptoms like uh, pain and fatigue, if they are really dominating, then I think that, that might um, suggest fibromyalgia. But if there are specific um, uh, uh, pathologies like iritis, then I think that that's less likely to be fibromyalgia. Right. So if they're very vague kind of symptoms, like I, 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 I can't get up in the mornings and um, I'm really tired all the time, I can't work, I feel miserable, all of those sorts of things, then I think that might point you towards fibromyalgia. And I've had patients who come and then they have um, pains, nerves, and they don't have a diagnosis, but they have several diagnoses, chest pains and all sorts. So I just wanted to know if some of the things <laughs> yeah, so fibromyalgia is a whole, um, whole area in itself, um, uh, which is which is which is actually quite compl complex and challenging, I think. Um, but yes, definitely um, uh, multiple, uh, seemingly unrelated symptoms, but all kind of tied together by distress that um, uh, is a signal of fibromyalgia probably, yeah. Okay, especially where they're all unexplained, you know, a, a bunch of things that are unexplained, you know, unexplained chest pain, unexplained um, uh, dysuria, um, you know, uh, headaches, lots of functional kind of symptoms, yeah. So this is the kind of some of the kinds of things that you want to um, look for uh, in examination. So this doesn't always happen, but um, in people with a good going uh, Achilles uh, tendonitis, uh, they may have a, um, uh, a swelling at the back of the heel. Um, this is an example of uh, dactylitis. So it's not just the fingers. Actually, it's probably more often the toes get uh, dactylitis. Um, and um, uh, and you can see this kind of the sausage idea because the whole digit swollen anatomically that uh, corresponds to inflammation in the subcutaneous tissues uh, the flexor tendon sheath uh, and the joints the whole all of the thing everything is, um, has got inflammatory edema on the MRI um, and there are very, f there are actually very few diseases where dactylitis is present. Um, so um, very, very rarely, I think you can get it in sarcoidosis. But otherwise, if you see dactylitis, it pretty much means they've got some kind of spondyloarthropathy, which means either reactive arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. I think it is described in ankylosing spondylitis, but it's very, very rare. I think that if you see dactylitis, it basically means reactive arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. I think that that's a reasonable rule of thumb. Um, and you can see the nail dystrophy uh, on that toe. Um, and this is a, um, the kind of the, the pitting that's described uh, in some people with um, uh, psoriatic nail disease. A nail disease seems to be more common in people with psoriatic arthritis than the average person with psoriasis. So, um, uh, and some people think that that's uh, related to a kind of enthesiopathy where the, um, where the nail joins the nail bed, uh, that that um, reflects uh, kind of almost a musculoskeletal manifestation of psoriasis rather than a cutaneous manifestation. Okay. Now, 
Um, we've seen, so this guy's got a, um, a swollen knee and um, Achilles tendonitis um, or enthesitis. How else could psoriatic arthritis potentially um, present? So back pain, yep. So it can look very much like ankylosing spondylitis. That's right. Pardon me? Hair loss. Hair loss. No, I don't. Um, I mean, I, I suppose if somebody's got very severe scalp psoriasis, uh, you can get um, hair damage, but that's not typical of psoriatic arthritis particularly. So um, this is one of the thing. This is one of the challenges about um, psoriatic arthritis is that it's um, quite um, pleiotrophic, uh, in the sense that um, that kind of very typical presentation of Mr. P.S. with one joint and some enthesitis uh, is just one of a myriad of um, options. So sometimes you can get a peripheral. Um, <coughs> Uh, oligoarthritis or even polyarthritis that can look a bit like rheumatoid arthritis. So it can mimic um, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, sometimes you, you, uh, it could be like ankylosing spondylitis. And actually, you know, in the uh, sort of 50 years ago, um, so, uh, it wasn't uh, an uncommon opinion that psoriatic arthritis didn't really exist as an entity, it was just psoriasis plus somebody with ankylosing spondylitis or uh, somebody with rheumatoid arthritis. It was just the coincidence of two uh, different diseases. That's not nearly so uh, common an opinion these days. But um, uh, some people with, um, uh, and, and some people with AS who have psoriasis, it's hard to know whether it's, it really is ankylosing spondylitis and a skin disease or whether it's psoriatic arthritis and they've got inflammatory back involvement. It gets varied. The semantics of the different spondyloarthropathy disorders can become very confusing. Uh, there's a f another manifestation which is really nasty called mutilans, where um, uh, you get massive bone um, resorption um, around the joints. Uh, and the whole digit kind of telescopes uh, and feels floppy. Um, and that's, um, uh, and, and it can be, and it can just kind of like pick out uh, partic uh, particular joints like this one, where you can see a very severely affected uh, middle finger, but um, most of the other fingers are, uh, look uh, unaffected. Now in rheumatoid arthritis, that would be really, really strange to see because if somebody gets a very damaged joint one place, it's likely that all of the other joints are like that as well. Psoriatic arthritis has this kind of peculiarity of sort of picking and choosing um, uh, particular joints. But that's a, um, that's a nasty manifestation which we hope to try and um, prevent. So, um, so if when we come back to Mr. Pierce, he doesn't give a history of trauma. When we examine him carefully, he's possibly got some nail dystrophy, and it turns out that he does have a family history of psoriasis. He doesn't have psoriasis himself, but he has a family history. And now, um, some people uh, can present with um, the arthritis of psoriatic arthritis without knowing they've got psoriasis, but they really have. Uh, and that's because um, uh, the severity of the psoriasis doesn't correlate very well with the severity of the arthritis. Um, some people, I, I would say, I think probably uh, it's true to say that the majority of people with psoriatic arthritis have psoriasis first and then develop arthritis, maybe 75%. Um, but there are um, a proportion of people, maybe 20% um, or so, that are 15 to 20% that uh, develop the arthritis first and then develop psoriasis later. Um, and so Mr. Pierce could be one of these those kinds of persons. And then there are a very and then there's a smaller group of people that um, 
have the arthritis that looks just like psoriatic arthritis, but they never get psoriasis. Now, those people are a bit puzzling because you say, well, how can you call them psoriatic arthritis when they don't even have psoriasis? Um, and it's just a kind of a pattern recognition. Um, one of the, the really challenging things about nailing down the diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis is that there's no pathognomonic biomarker, like there is for lupus or uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, there, in psoriatic arthritis, there's no blood test that you can do, no autoantibody that you can test for and say, right, this, this clinches the diagnosis. So it can be very difficult in s for some, f some t sometimes uh, to be sure about the uh, diagnosis. Yeah. About 2%. Yeah, so it's a relatively common condition. You'll have lots of people uh, with, with psoriasis. Uh, the, uh, the number of people that get psoriatic arthritis amongst those people with psoriasis is, um, uh, varies widely from study to study, partly because it depends on how diligently you look for musculoskeletal symptoms uh, and how kind of lax or strict you are about whether musculoskeletal symptoms could be due to inflammatory arthritis or not. But the kind of number that uh, is kind of um, bandied around is sort of between 10 and 30 percent probably of people with psoriasis get psoriatic arthritis. Okay, so uh, in our patient, Mr. Uh, P.S., he has, we've seen that he's got um, tendinitis and swelling at uh, an Achilles insertion. He's definitely got a right knee fusion. He's got a slightly elevated CRP level uh, and he's um, moderately <coughs> impaired um, functionally, but he's able to work still. Okay, so the next thing we have to, um, so, so we're pretty, we're, we're, we're thinking, well, he's got nail dystrophy and he's got a family history of psoriasis. The clinical p picture of the, um, of his uh, musculoskeletal disease is consistent with psoriatic arthritis. Making a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis is perfectly acceptable in this case, which is a relief because that's why I've chosen him. So what do we do about treating someone with psoriatic arthritis that is an, at the initial presentation? What's, the, what's your initial management options? Pain relief. Uh, so, do you mean like paracetamol? Non steroidal. Non uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory. Yep, okay. Fair enough. Anything else? Any other possibilities? Prednisone? Okay, so a steroid drug, so it's a strong anti inflammatory. Okay. Ointment. Yeah, yeah. So the, for the skin disease, he doesn't actually have any skin disease. Oh. He's got some nail dystrophy, but um, local um, local application of corticosteroids for mild nail dystrophy is probably not very effective. I don't think. Intracellular injection. Yeah. So, just a couple of areas. so we could direct the steroids to the site of inflammation. Yep. Okay. So those are pretty much the same ideas that I came up with. Um, so NSAIDs definitely are first line treatment for most uh, inflammatory arthritic conditions. Um, they're good, they're, they're, they're often very helpful in the short term. Long term, they have a, a few caveats. As you know, there, there are risks associated with long term um, non -steroidals. The other thing about non is I think it's worth um, uh, emphasizing is that there is quite an individual variation in response to uh, d to different NSAIDs so if um, your first prescription of ibuprofen doesn't work then don't give up try a different um, uh, NSAID. Uh, local corticosteroid injections so uh, what do people think about injecting his heel? few 
shakes of the head. Anybody want to be more definite? You can, you can rupture. It would be something you would only do if it's really hard, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, this is, this is um, probably a little bit controversial because inflamed tendons tend to rupture more easily. So when people have had injections and they rupture, it's hard to know how to be sure about what to attribute the cause to. Um, however, uh, the, 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 the kind of general standard of care would be not to inject directly into the substance of a tendon because of the, um, the risk of rupture. Um, but uh, injecting around the tendon in the peritendinous space uh, is, um, uh, is almost certainly safe. So, but to know where the, the needle is in the peri uh, tendon space, um, because the stakes are, are high, most people that I know would do this under ultrasound guidance. So um, uh, that can be done by many rheumatologists, orthopedic surgeons, uh, emergency physicians do musculoskeletal ultrasound themselves. Um, and we'll do that, do an injection under ultrasound guidance. Otherwise, there are many interventional radiologists that will um, do it for you. So, um, so it's not unreasonable to do to to inject uh, a troublesome uh, Achilles uh, tendonitis, but just don't inject into the tendon. Um, now, <coughs> systemic steroids are also effective for treating um, uh, psoriatic arthritis, but there is a a, a caveat, particular caveat, um, with psoriasis. So this is a really good um, New Zealand uh, website called DermNet New Zealand. You've probably seen it. And um, uh, erythrodermic psoriasis is quite nasty. Uh, and one of the triggers, so people um, may need hospitalisation um, for that. Uh, and it's um, a, a recognised complication of um, systemic steroids in people with psoriasis. Usually people with not great psoriasis, like pustular psoriasis or fairly extensive psoriasis. So in people with um, uh, quite a bit of skin disease, oral stero systemic steroids are um, definitely best avoided.